Welcome to the ICU Management and Practice Digiconf Wellbeing in the ICU. Our Editor-in-Chief, Professor Jean-Louis Vincent, will moderate the session. Along with Professor of Critical Care Medicine, Laura Hurriluck, Emergency Medicine and Critical Care Dr. Orlando Ruben Perez Nieto, Anesthesiologist and Intensivist in Academic Medicine, Shala Siddiqui, and Head of Clinics in ICU and Head of Clinical Nutrition Department, Professor Elizabeth Diwali. Let us now welcome the moderator of today's Digicom, Professor Jean Louis Vincent. Hello, hello. Good to be with you this afternoon and um, to moderate this interesting discussion on well being in the ICU. Yeah, I am Jean Louis Vincent, uh, professor at the University of Brussels, and the others have already been introduced. So that makes my task even easier. Uh, our topic is really well in the center of our preoccupations, not only in the intensive care unit, but also with ICU management and practices. Of course, it's one of, uh, of uh, an important topic relevant to us. And the subtitle, I think, is uh, Staff Health Humanized ICU Improved Care. And indeed, it does uh, make a lot of sense. So we have about one hour to discuss all these aspects uh, with the four uh, speakers who were introduced just one minute ago. So I would like to leave the, um, the floor, if I may say, uh, immediately to, I think Elizabeth de Waal is the first one, right? Elizabeth, uh, you, can, uh, you can start. We are looking forward to listening to uh, your thoughts uh, in relation to what you wrote in uh, ICU management and practice. Thank you so much. And I'm not going to bring you slides. I only bring you pictures because I want to share my experience last year in a role as a medical doctor, in a role as a, man as a medical manager. And of course, besides all the medical stuff and the, the environment that we needed to create for our patients, we also worked very hard together to create an environment for healthcare practitioners. And uh, this is indeed what I shared uh, in, um, in the journal. So our experience in, Br in Brussels was that everyone in the head management of the ICU took responsibility for a part of the management of this COVID crisis because you needed to act quick, you needed to uh, take into account so many challenges, but we cannot forget ourselves because otherwise we cannot take care of other patients. So this is what we did. And personally, I was, uh, especially in the first wave, very concerned about communication and physical and psychological well-being for the patients and their family. So you could see that we had some responsibilities, ownership for uh, some parts of the program. And I will show you some pictures of the four main, um, main frameworks that we designed into this uh, care plan. So first of all, communication is very important and you can take it literally that you have a place where people can talk, but we also uh, have to take into account that in this uh, multidisciplinary team, you have medical doctors, you have physicians, you have nurses, but you also have the staff uh, making the operational things work like um, the cleaning man and uh, the logistic people and we, realized that we had to work as a team and that everybody should be aware of all the new implementations, the new rules, the new way to work. So we also worked with a lot of visuals. You know, we are in Brussels. Not all the people can understand uh, the protocols and the language. So we worked very visually and we made a place where people can come to get information read the things on the walls. Uh, we had a laptop with free access to be able to access the information that is on the computer network of the, of the hospital because we are used to that, but not everybody's used to that. And there was always somebody around where you could talk to, uh, where you could leave your questions and you could get an answer. So communication is very important. This is how it looked like. I know it looked messy, but those are pictures from the first wave. And to have this hub, to have this place where everybody can come back to, that's really important that you have a center in your ICU, 
a cockpit where you can come and where you can share. So communication was also about having a digital communication that we could have a safe environment uh, on the phone, for example, where we could share when we would have another COVID uh, going open and a new um, room going open. So we shared a lot of information and we invested a lot in communication. To be able to do that, not only for the healthcare practitioners, but also for the relatives, we had some helping hands. We had midwives and doctors even from another medical department from the center of fertility, which was lower in activity because of the COVID crisis. And they came to help. So they took all the phone calls from the relatives, but also from the staff members so that we could concentrate on the patients and on the medical care. And this was reported to be a big relief that you could focus on your core business, taking care of patients and that all the other stuff was being organized and taken care even by healthcare professionals that are not normally active in the ICU. And we proved that uh, we had a, a large feedback. This was a great help to have a call center. And then I know it sounds funny that we had call center and girls in the call center, but it was really um, a good thing to have so that we felt supported and that we created this environment. They also uh, coordinated the medical students that let patients talk to their relatives. And this was already in March 2020 that we organized it, but somebody had to organize it for the well being of the patients and for the well being of the medical team. This was very satisfaction to see that the patients were so well encountered and that the medical students could actually do something very, very useful. So this was for us also a psychological relief. Um, what about the psychological support plan? Well, of course, we contacted the board that we have in the hospital on well-being and our hospitals very proactive on that field. But you know, ICU sometimes is a closed environment. You really need to pull them on the floor and come to your unit. So we had psychologists being present at the coffee breaks and some of them would just do a little chat, but we had some moments where we had to do uh, really breakouts with people with panic attacks or, or sudden crying. So the psychologicals, they really had um, a major role. And of course we had a breathing exercise. You know how that goes in ICU. You have early adapters, you have late adapters. We also had a site next to the hospital where healthcare practitioners could go and see uh, some professionals to talk to. Um, so this was really helpful. Of course, our experience was that some of us would um, accept this offer and really go for a talk, uh, talk about what they were bothering about uh, all their issues. And some of them would be very critical and say that they don't need it and they can cope and that they don't have any issues. But of course, with every change uh, or everything or initiative, you will always have early adopters and late adopters. And then one of the things we did is try to have a personal approach because I'm not an expert in well-being. And um, we noticed every time I was on a night shift or a weekend shift, I questioned people, what would you like to have to make your life better in the middle of this crisis? And the responses are very, very variable. Uh, some of them said just, I wanna spend more time with my family. You know, if you make me work one more weekend, my wife is gonna leave me. And I was like, uh oh, that's an issue. Let's try to solve it. Some of them had really psychological difficulties with all the pain they saw. And they said, I cannot cope anymore with all the loss of patience and the bad news I have to bring to family members. Another one said just, I will get paid for all my extra work. And some of them would like to have a quiet place. So we made a quiet, a quiet place thanks to the foundation. And some of them wanted to have some distraction. So we had this, um, this um, tournament uh, in the weekends, the Corona Cup uh, during our free time. So my uh, conclusion on all of this is of course, to make it a good environment for the patients, you need good healthcare practitioners in a good shape and I, we were really, really happy to work together and to create this environment so that we could work together for the mental well-being of our healthcare practitioners. So this is what I wanted to share with you. And I'm very um, looking forward to see what the experts will have to say on our initi initiatives. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. That was very thoughtful and, uh, and the four 
um, subtitles were definitely uh, excellent communication, call center, psychological support, and personalized approach. I, 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 I like the sentence you pronounced that you are not an expert in well-being. I don't know what an expert in well-being is, but uh, I think you are an expert in well-being <laughs> from what you say. Is there any specific comment or question before we move on? Of course, we'll have a general discussion at the end, but uh, but I think um, you know these are very good points and, and also a, a good experience, um, which is uh, reported to us. Uh, in terms of communication, by the way, a small comment. I, I saw my friend uh, Joseph Varon in, in, in Texas, who had, uh, you know, when, when uh, everybody was uh, disguised to enter the room and the patient could not recognize, of course, who was in the room. Every team member had his or her picture on the chest so that the patient could see the real face. And I thought it was a very good idea. We have not implemented this uh, um, in, in, in our hospital in Brussels, but I thought it was, uh, it was a very good idea uh, to personalize, humanize the, uh, the atmosphere. Any comment from uh, the three other panelists? You want to keep your comments for the end? So then I will uh, I will give the floor. I think Loha is the second one, right? You are the next one, Loha. I think if so. you are ready to go, you are more than welcome, uh, Loha. Or or like is from Toronto, as it was said uh, initially. Thank you. Thank you for uh, for having me here. Um, I was just going to highlight a few points that I made in the article. I'm not going to use slides to do it. Um, but I want to sort of recap uh, some of the points that uh, Dr. Styra and I made. When we were asked to, to write this and we were looking at um, the results that others had put out there about uh, the ICU experience of post-traumatic stress, symptomatology, depression, anxiety, and we looked at some of the driving causes that had been identified already in the literature. And when we considered what these causes were discussing, it came to us that, you know, it really uh, brought us back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now, Maslow's hierarchy of needs identifies some essential needs that every human has in order to move forward without having a psychological, um, negative psychological impacts in their lives. And he identified these back in the 1950s and, and uh, talked about physiological needs safety needs, the need to have love and belonging in our lives, the needs for esteem, and finally, the last need, the need for self-fulfillment. Now, self-fulfillment is, is one that, you know, may go to our state of happiness, but doesn't necessarily cause psychological harms if unmet in, in our estimation. Um, however, physiologic needs, if we start with that, you know, the basic ability for self-care, time to have a break to go to a washroom during the day when patients are piling in um, and to have somebody sort of spell you off so that you can rehydrate when you're in all those layers of PPE and behind the mask. Um, those needs are very important. And I think it, it identifies how we have some lapses and how we've previously structured teams because you know we've all had days where it's been hard to eat, hard to drink, um, but now we have many more of those days. And unless we look at how our workflow um, is, it's really hard for us uh, to maintain our physiologic needs and our own, you know, sort of basic needs as human beings for us to be able to provide care to others. The issue of safety. I think when the pandemic first started, you know, we had all of these issues around the world about PPE, its effectiveness, is it droplet, is it airborne? Um, you know, now there's been increasing evidence that there's an airborne component to this. And, you know, what I'd like to see is more transparency about what that means in terms of our PPE, something like Elizabeth's cockpit, having updated information as information evolves. The same for vaccines. While many of us have been vaccinated, our families have not. 
And we know that efficacy of vaccines are going to change as the virus mutates further. So, you know, update scientific papers. Where's the evidence coming from that claims that the vaccines are still effective? I think we're all science-based and, you know, to have an attitude that just says, trust me, you know, this vaccine is fine um, or without providing incidents, the side effects and the reference points is, is really hard for people to keep moving and feeling safe while they do so and keeping their families safe at home. Things like outbreaks um, that happen, you know, what were the driving forces of the outbreak? How did it happen if we were all so safe in the current PPE? I think transmitting that information organization wide as we evolve is also very important. And yet, you know, these are things that we've never had to really deal with on such a large scale before um, that are important to consider as we move forward in these ongoing waves of this pandemic. Um, you know, things uh, that are important uh, should not be imposed. Uh, so for example, you know, saying that you're going to have somebody come into the ICU to fulfill certain roles, um, even if it's communication and helping with communicate with families, asking the ICU team, how would that work from your perspective? What would make it work? Where do you anticipate the difficulties rather than saying we're bringing people in is also a very important thing um, in terms of you know, both safety and maintaining patient safety and family safety, uh, but also not um, increasing the workload uh, inadvertently through a desire to help. Uh, the idea of belonging. I think a lot of people, um, you know, uh, we need to feel supported within the team. I think we're very good, as I pointed out in that article, of conveying support to families. We're not maybe so good at conveying support among ourselves as team, understanding that it's okay to need support, understanding that different people are gonna be at different places at different times. Um, you know, you're gonna have strengths at some times and less resilience at others, and that is okay. Um, you know, uh, an acceptance of that uh, amongst the team and helping each other when we're not so strong, um, that's not a sign of weakness, right? And that should never be seen as a sign of weakness. And that needs to be continuously communicated uh, as we move forward. Uh, you know, and the idea of, of uh, you know, esteem of, of being valued uh, as a field that is really very much on the front lines. Uh, you know, in a recent interview, some of my colleagues called us the last line of defense, not the front lines anymore. Um, I think means the organizations need to ask us, right? But I also think that if we look to the organizations to be valued or to obtain our own sense of inner value, we're looking in the wrong place. You know, we need to understand who we are and what we bring and the value that that has in and of itself. You can't always look for others on the outside to convey that they value you. But if an organization is going to try to commit to an expression that, you know, thank you, then make sure it's meaningful. Um, you know, and, and part of that meaningfulness means to recognize the unique contributions. Uh, you know, whether it's having that space that Elizabeth like outlines so well of respite, a place where there's green things that live, you know, um, something that, that allows us to go outside, uh, that is much more valued than having a pin that says thank you to the healthcare heroes, uh, you know, which doesn't convey the same kind of messaging, it doesn't bring it into enough depth. And finally, I think, you know, the last piece I wanna emphasize because I don't think it's received enough attention. We are not just professionals, we are people, right? Everybody talks about the worry about bringing the virus home, um, you know, of uh, getting their, their family vaccinated and those concerns are, are very, very real. But it's also what else we bring home in terms of the emotional toll and the fatigue and how we talk about that and not exclude the people who care from us from our lives. And I think, you know, in terms of some of the help that we need is to understand how to do that without turning your family into your counselor, but at the same time, not shutting them out of a very big moment that we're all living and all of the 
effort and, and emotions that go into that. Uh, because when you care for somebody, you care for the whole person. And I described and I referenced one of the articles that I think is really meaningful from Vox, which is written by um, a family member of an ICU worker. Um, and I encourage you all to read it because I think the words in that are very, very powerful. And it brings home the dangers that we face by not figuring this out because you know, to lose your family um, in the midst of this is, is a very big price to pay. And it's one that no one should have to pay. Yep, okay, thank you very much. That's very, very thoughtful. Uh, now we have a number of, uh, of attendees, uh, close to 100, I believe. And uh, questions are starting to come in. So maybe we can uh, already take one for Elizabeth and Oroloa, uh, how do you cope when losing a team member and can't bring the team spirit up? Uh, that's, of course, a tough situation. Um, any advice, thoughts? Well, like I said, I think it's both. First of all, get in some professional help. Uh, we did it with a psychologist, with a psychi psychiatrist, but they had too many COVID cases in between their ranks to be able to help us, but uh, bring in some professional help. And secondly, ask the nurses. I see the question of how can we help them? Ask them what would be of help? Because like Laura said, sometimes you need real practical things. I mean, it's nice to have a, a clap on the shoulder, but when you have a when you, when you have a space to go, when you have somebody to talk to, also the practical things, the, the, you need to know things like what is gonna be the vaccination scheme and so on. I was very happy to see that the cleaning man would stop at the visuals on the, on the wall and go read them because he was interested because we as medical doctors, we know where the information is. When we have a question, we know that we have to go on the IT system. But when you are doing um, a manual work all day, sometimes you don't have the time or the channels to, to get your questions answered. So easy access to questions, ask them what they want, provide an environment like we ask the foundation of our hospital to bring in the plants and, and all the stuff. It might seem silly, but it really helps to create this environment. And another thing is, how hard it is, please try to keep a good spirit. And for example, we I know it's just an example. It might not be a good one when it worked for us. We created, you know, on the digital phones, uh, a communication on WhatsApp for practical things. And then we had one with jokes, Corona jokes. I just checked, we had more than 1,064 uh, jokes in that, in that group, you know, because Sometimes you, you just need a, a second to laugh and, and that's, uh, it can help for some of us. Yeah, that's, that's important indeed, um, Laura. No, I, I agree completely. I think the first thing is to acknowledge the emotion and acknowledge the loss. And, you know, it, it may even be coming up with a way to honor that person, you know, um, that, that stays with the team forever. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that I do is I write. Uh, so, you know, in the article, I gave you an example of one of the poems that I wrote. And I think having those um, can act as a way for people to discuss what uh, resonates with them um, and allow them to start unpacking their emotions. Uh, you know, I think one of the things is to recognize the resilience. So for example, this weekend, um, I had sent out a poem on, on Twitter that's called Still Here. Because you know what, despite everything that we're doing, we're still here. And that in and of itself needs to be celebrated despite the losses that hurt like hell. You know, like we are still here. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's recognizing the small things and the value that, um, that brings to us in our lives that allows us to continue going. Um, you know, and, and that is the real definition of resilience and courage is that, you know, we try to find a way despite all of the emotions, but we also have to acknowledge those emotions to be able to process them to try and find that way. And if we bury them like we're so used to doing and compartmentalize them, it, it's not going to work. The walls that we're building are going to come crashing down. So, you know, again, it's that honesty and asking the team what would help them. Uh, I can't emphasize that enough because usually they have an idea and it may be different for every team. It may be different for members, but 
if you ask enough, you'll be able to build enough support. Yeah. Scale. Yeah. Good point. We have other questions about burnout and people leaving the field, but we will keep them for later. I'd like to um, propose to listen to Orlando Rubin, uh, who has uh, uh, a great interest in these uh, in these matters, and uh, he is from Mexico and he is very active in the field. Orlando, can you share your thoughts, please? Hi, thank you very much for the invitation. Is Curious, Mexico, being a country of middle low income, occupies the first place in doctors infected with COVID-19 and also in deaths of health personnel. And it's been published by Silvia Niamendis before. Um, so we know that's very difficult, very difficult situation. Um, likewise, in the psychological support um, strategies for the staff apparently have not worked well. And so many of the personnel of healthcare is um, suffering burnout uh, as we did sometimes. And what, so I have to talk about um, humanization in the intensive care unit. And it's a topic that I like very much. Um, we know our focus not only in saving lives, uh, we are focused about the patient, about uh, their feelings, about their relatives. And so um, I like to share with you some phrases from Hippocrates, the, being the father of the medicine, um, also talk about humanization. The first one is um, that the doctor sometimes cures, almost always give treatment, but always must comfort the patient and maybe we must comfort another doctors too. Dr. Dagwell uh, already have spoken about the communication between the doctor and the patient, be, between the patient and the relatives, but uh, we must take in account that the communication in ICU is a very difficult situation because sometimes the patient is intubated, is in mechanical ventilation, um, the patient is with sedation, and it difficult um, a lot this situation. So how we can improve this, this situation? Well, well we can um, use some strategies to, um, to improve the communication, like uh, use some, give me a minute. Statistics in chose the adequate sedation to the patient and taking account the clinical situation. The, the patient with ARS, as example, is a patient that in several arts, the patient has to be uh, with um, a um, deep sedation. Quest. We can use some drugs like propofol, like ketamine, like dexmedetomidin. But when the patient is improved his condition and is better oxygenation, we uh, are we must reduce the sedation level and use mild sedation in these patients, like using dexmedetomidin and some analgesia. Uh, maybe a little bit of, of propofol and the patient will be wake up. Um, we must um, have to communicate the patient that uh, we have to speak to patient by, her, by his name. We, um, we have to ask the patient uh, if he's comfortable, if he's, he have any pain, or what can we do to improve uh, his condition? The um, video video calls with mobile dispositives it's been associated to uh, reduce it, to reduce risk of delirium. The delirium uh, affects at sixty percent in of critical ill patients is another thing that 
we have to take into account about the, uh, for the humanization of the intensive care unit. Um, what, um, sorry, about delirium is that it's been associated to an increase of 30% the mortality of intensive care patients, intensive care, care uh, units. And we have to, to make some recommendations, some recommendations to reduce it. And in like non-pharmacological um, and multi-component inter interventions, um, like one, well, daily assessment of delirium or the pain scales in the patient. Like sedation, not use benzodiazepines. In Mexico, the benzodiazepine is the drug, the most drug to sedate patients. It's, I, we are fighting against it in about last 10 years. Mm, I think against to what you're saying? Fighting against? Uh, uh, Midazolam? Midazolam? And oh, oh yeah, 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 we should, yeah, I was listening to you, you know, can't we just stop sedation? I mean, that's obsolete to sedate all these patients so that they are weak and, uh, and as you say, delirious and, uh, and they have to pay a price during the following weeks, if not months. Uh, can't we stop it if we humanize the ICU and perhaps open the doors to the family members? No, you don't think so? Yes, we, we open the doors, but um, in Mexico, it's a very difficult situation or in Latin America, uh, because we don't have enough education of humanization. We are um, teaching this and some, some Doctors uh, like in Uruguay, in Argentina, in Brazil are implementing strategies like humanization intensive care unit project, Proyecto UCI is, is very famous in here, but the application uh, is yet very, very low. Uh, we, lo yeah. we have um, mobile devices to improve the communication in the medic, in the patient with the med mm between the patient and the relatives. But in the same uh, unit, we have inter-families. We have sisters, we have uh, fathers and, and sons. Um, and unfortunately, some of the relatives died um, for, um, by COVID-19. And it's um, very difficult um, to communicate this to the patients see, because it, it works on things, in, in, uh, it works the psychological uh, outcome in these patients. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you for, for, for these uh, thoughts. We will speak about the, uh, the relatives in, uh, in, in just a moment. Uh, uh, I think it's a very important issue, of course, uh, very important to have the family support. And, uh, but, uh, but perhaps uh, we, can, uh, we can ask uh, uh, Shala Siddiqui to, uh, to tell us a little bit what she thinks, and then we can open up the, uh, the discussion. Please, uh, Shala. Thank you so much, Prof. And uh, thank you, everybody who's spoken so far. I found it extremely inspiring. Um, I work in Boston at one of the Harvard hospitals. And during the first wave, it's interesting how the psychological impact of the first wave was different from the second wave, um, especially for the healthcare workers in the ICU. But um, I myself uh, was um, working in the ICU. We were doing surge ICU. So, you know, it was pretty much 24-7 uh, of the COVID ICU at that time. This was around April. And I noticed that um, when I reflected on my own life and the people around me, if we did have a second to reflect, that it was um, having a huge impact. And I wanted to capture that and the, uh, the aspects of that. So with the help of a team and with some psychologist input, um, I wanted to do a quick, a quick survey. I knew the response rate would be really low because people are so busy, but we managed to get above 200 uh, responses and people really wanted to talk. So it was a mixed methods uh, study with the, using the generalized anxiety depression scale as well as open-ended leading questions. And I, if you don't mind, I'd just like to show the, the graphics of this study so that I don't forget pretty much. 
Um, so pretty much we asked, and then I did a um, qualitative analysis. I have a background as a master's in ethics. So I did have some background in qualitative analysis. I did a um, uh, coding of the, of the responses that we got. We found that uh, from the leading questions that we asked, which were, what are the frequent topics with which you worry, for which you worry about, what scares you the most, uh, what are the fears, how do you balance your call of duty versus fears, what frustrates you about your daily duties, what is your reaction, how do you handle it, what are some of the actions taken in the ICU, because a lot of wellness tools were offered like free yoga sessions, virtual tai chi, um, food, etc., all kinds of things that the hospital could offer. Um, we didn't have the luxury. I don't know if you've been to Longwood Avenue in Boston. We didn't have open spaces. So we, we pretty much had a, a brick concrete jungle around us. And that was adding to the, the burnout. You know, we wouldn't see sunlight for days. And especially with the PPE, sometimes the carbon dioxide levels were rising within us and getting migraine headaches for 24 seven. Um, so those were the things that we were dealing with. I had two children at home, which I, uh, and I was quarantining from them, not because I was infected, but I just wanted, I didn't know what was going on. Nobody knew. So I would live in a small corner of my basement uh, and not see my kids, not be able to hug them. So I could imagine what people were feeling. Um, basically the groups that came out where there were a lot of negative emotions, uh, people talked about how they did their own coping strategies, but there were also positive reinforcements and the call of duty, the, the fact that we thought of ourselves as fearless because we were just, nobody questioned going into these ICUs in the first wave. Nobody, even though the fear was there, it was tangible. No one held back from helping patients at that time. It was um, almost as if people were just taking this on as their role that they needed to play. And it was very altruistic. Uh, and then we asked for recommendations. As some of you spoke, we asked for what they wanted. Um, interestingly, there was of course a high rate of burnout, a high rate of fear, more so in women and in nurses. Um, and also that could be the confounder that the response rate was higher from women. Uh, however, we found that even residents, uh, the women were more affected. Um, and then we also found signs of depression, trouble falling asleep, some, uh, some actual physical symptoms. Um, and then we found that the worry was also significantly, statistically significantly higher among women compared to men, um, the nurse, nurses compared to non-nurses. And then when we asked qualitative uh, uh, things, we found that fear of infection and critical illness and death was very high. There was uncertainty about the future. This was around April to May last year. There was no end in sight at that time. Vaccines was just, a, um, I think it was just a, a, an idea at that point. Um, they, there were a lot of staffing shortages. Uh, people were not getting so sick at that time. Our second surge was much worse, but I think the psychological impact of the first surge was, was worse for us. Um, there was extreme workload. There were concerns about delivering futile or non-beneficial care. Uh, there were a lot of ethical dilemmas. I myself am, in, am interested in ethical end-of-life dilemmas. And I actually wrote a paper on allowing uh, family members in the ICU with full PPE, even though there were no vaccinations at that point, and that was published. Um, we were very interested in allowing, especially patients who were dying and we were moving to comfort measures, uh, having family members there for one hour, which was a compromise and a lot of back and forth with the administration. They were worried about the staff getting infected from families, et cetera. But we made a special um, a corridor for families to enter and take the patient there and then have them spend time at the, at the last hour of their lives. We found that very hugely impactful for both the staff as well as the uh, family. I myself lost my mother to, um, uh, who was in England at that time and I was in the US and I couldn't go see her and I saw the whole thing on, on FaceTime and I wrote about it as well. But I can understand what families go through when they're not able to have that grief um, and there's just no closure. We asked about personal and professional sacrifices, the impact that the person in the staff is having on themselves versus, as well as their family members. And people were just freaked out as they said, quote unquote, uh, they just were fearful. Um, when I spoke to the psychologist, some very interesting aspects came out that 75% of the staff rejected wellness resources being offered by the hospital. So they did not find 
that the yoga and all of that as useful as they found mindfulness being receptive to feedback, small ma uh, mid managerial level um, feedback uh, sessions every day. I found the boss giving us town halls every day, very, very reassuring. And at that time, remember, we didn't know what was going on. We didn't know the numbers. We didn't know the, the trajectory. So he had a bigger picture and he could share that with us. And I found that very reassuring. Uh, frequent touch base sessions with mid-level management, for example, nurse managers, and I think some of you have talked about that in different variations. Reassurance, daily pep talks and closing the feedback loop with actionable items, finding out what people really wanted. Um, empathy and communication came out uh, and compassion came out right on the top. If people uh, would feel that there was someone they could speak to and you know someone who could just reassure them. And I know that in our daily lives, we prefer that too. And um, we do that for our patients, but just holding someone's hand and working together as a team member was so much, so much more useful and that reduced the burnout I felt. And then we did a follow-up study which did show that it did have an impact. And so in the end, um, I just wanted to say that humanism is, is right on the top of trying to deal with stressful situations. It's like a war and in those warlike uh, uh, situations, having a leader or having leadership that is compassionate and open to, um, has an open door is always uh, much better than um, having distance and being out of touch. Thanks, that's, that's all I have to share. I'll stop sharing now. Prof, you're, um, you're muted. Thank you very much, Anna. I think it was uh, very thoughtful. And uh, of course, we are very sorry about the story of your mother. It must have been terrible. And uh, we have seen a number of cases like this, unfortunately, and that was terrible. We will come back to the family in just a moment, but as promised, and perhaps you could start the discussion on this. Uh, the first question we got was uh, from uh, a senior nurse working in Singapore. And, uh, and, and she says, you know, um, some nurses go in burnout. What can we do to prevent it? And uh, uh, in normal times, we would like to put them on, uh, on holiday, uh, on leave, uh, but uh, it may be difficult when there is a surge of patients. Uh, so what can we do in case of burnout? So I think that triangle that Laura, I think, referred to where you look, the Maslow's triangle, where you start with what are your needs? You have food, you have security, um, and security is, is nebulous, right? We don't know in COVID what is security. Is the PP at that time, we didn't know whether it's protecting us or not. But if you give them what they want in terms of their personal, very personal basic needs, and then move up the triangle, the reassurance, and then the constant feedback that yes, we are there, we have your back, we are taking care of you. And um, of course there are excruciating circumstances when people have to leave, but there are times when you can talk to them about the, the role that they're fulfilling. We are actually, all of us are in this for some altruistic reason. And I recently studied something on in the Japanese literature called Ikigai, where, is, where you find meaning in your work through um, reflection on what you do and how you interact with your other colleagues. So I think staying in touch with your nurses would be very, very important. Yeah, um, Laura, some, some, some others ask, what about the long-term consequences? What about those people who can continue to, to work uh, today, but uh, who are eager to leave the field when uh, when the things will be over, when the pandemic will be uh, will be better controlled. Uh, so, um, can you can you share your thoughts with us about this? Um, yeah, I think uh, a lot of times, what uh, you know, sometimes even thinking about leaving the field uh, can be a way of of coping, of of just imagining what life could be like uh, if we weren't in the field. But I think. I, I see it as a warning sign uh, when people start to talk that way in terms of going back to them and asking them what is happening, um, what can be done uh, to keep them in the field, what can be done for them to still find meaning in what they're doing. Um, you know, because I would, you know, I think we have to understand that two things. One, uh, 
Um, ideally, we don't want people to leave. We want them to continue to do what they were trained to do and what they love doing. Um, and hopefully, you know, find that love of, of what they do uh, even throughout these times. Two, if they do leave, um, I think there's two things. One, we need their help to understand how we prevent other people from leaving. Uh, two, we need to help them understand that it's okay to make that choice to leave, that this is in no way a personal or a professional failure. Um, after, you know, for many, what was a long career uh, in, in helping others. Um, and, and I think it's okay to understand that for some people, it's just too much and uh, they have to save themselves as people. And if that means leaving and finding a different career path, then that too is okay. But no matter what, the support needs to be there uh, from us, uh, no matter what choices they ultimately make. Okay. Yeah. Others. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth. Yes. Um, thank you, Laura. I find it very interesting, but something that pops up in my mind is the nurses or the MDs, they leave the, they leave the field, but most of the time it's not because they don't like their job. You know, they started off in the job because they really yeah. want to do it, but it's more the circumstances uh, that are very, very extreme at the moment, but that we have to uh, keeping into our minds when this will be less or more controlled is that we should change the field. Mm -hmm. And we are today talking a little bit to the convinced because, you know, we pay attention to well-being, but we also know, and it's from the data that we saw from Shara, for example, that a lot of people are not are not thinking the same way about uh, changing the, the environment that we work in. I mean, it, you do have to realize, or it's my experience, that it's still uh, a very dominant, it's a very uh, active, adrenaline-driven environment. Um, and I feel the change, and a lot of people feel it too and would like to see it happen, but a, non a lot of them stand up to actually do so. And I think that it's one of the barriers of change implementation is that we are working in this uh, environment where it's not really the tone. So so I think this is one of the biggest challenges to, to show that if you soften up the environment, it's not taking away your quality of work or it's not taking away your, your the, the prestations or the, the things that you, are, that you are accomplishing. And sometimes this is a little bit, to my uh, impression, it's a little bit translated as, what are you doing? I mean, we are the heroes of the world and you're softening our world. So I would really like to see your opinion because this is something that I, I bounced into while trying to implement a lot of those uh, uh, cultural change management. I, I totally agree. I cannot agree more. I, I, that's why I go back to the needs and understanding the needs will change and, and constantly asking about that. But you know, the other thing that I found myself emphasizing the last uh, time I was in the IC, which was just a few days ago, we don't need another hero. There is no romance here. Right? Uh, you know, we play a very important role, but the worship of the hero uh, needs to end, like, because it sets up all kinds of negative psychological impacts. And you know, we are privileged because we have a certain skill set. We've trained hard to achieve that but the hero's got to go. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Shala, you wanted to say something, but be um, before you do, uh, allow me to remind the audience that they are welcome to raise questions or comments in the Q&A uh, side of, uh, of, the, um, of the Zoom. Yeah, Shala. Sorry, I just wanted to make another comment on that, that I have been reading some uh, psychological literature on a study I'm doing on compassion. And there's something called the feminization of the ICU, which doesn't mean that have more women there. Maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. But it's the qualities of uh, nurturing and um, the humanistic qualities that I think all of us are talking about, which are now uh, so much in need and in demand by both the caregivers as well as the patients and their families. And those qualities, I think, must be taught in a form of a structured curriculum to our trainees now. Because I think that is what the nursing, Florence Nightingale, and, and the whole thing, how they started in giving caregiving. That was the basis of everything that we do. Yeah. Someone is, all, is also emphasizing that uh, it's sometimes difficult to work with doctors who are less 
experienced and less knowledgeable than usual when we are overwhelmed with uh, with uh, with patients uh, we hopefully get some help from other doctors but sometimes they don't know much about intensive care medicine and that's also frustrating for these nurses to realize that the doctors are not the best they wanted to have huh? orlando is it something that you have experienced as well um, i i Mm, I like to share with you some commentary. Uh, it's uh, about burnout. Then the first uh, um, one thing that contributed to the burnout in the beginning of pandemic is the exaggerated personal protective equipment, the Tyvek. Um, we know actually that we don't need much equipment to to be safe and to work with uh, better humor. A good work environment must be ensured to obtain good results and to ensure that doctors and nurses treat um, the patient with quality. If we um, if we improve the communication, in, including our chiefs or or directors of the hospital, we can we a better job. Uh, everyone, that's only. Yep, 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 yep. Okay. Um, maybe, oh yeah, L Laura, you wanted to add something on this? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, you know, this is one of the lessons that have come out of this pandemic of, you know, if we do need to redeploy staff, whether it's to the ICU or to a COVID ward, uh, what is the essential uh, learning and skill set uh, that we need the staff to, to have and how do we help them acquire that? And then how do we have our team understand, uh, you know, that skill set so that it de-stresses them because they don't know who has what knowledge or what skills, whether to trust or not to trust. And when you're dealing with somebody who's really critically ill and time is of the essence, uh, that, you know, can can create a huge psychological strain as, as the questions have pointed out. And I would like to see a central repository. I think we've got some of these uh, tools already, um, you know, in the European society and in other societies as well. And, you know, it, it, I think the, the downside is that some people who've tried to develop these have tried to make everybody intensivists um, in from time, you know, zero to, you know, 100 kilometers an hour. Um, and I don't think, I think we've got to relook at that goal and say, okay, what do we need? Um, and, and then if we have a common language and a common skill set, it, it takes some of that stress away. Um, but I think I'd like to see that as, as being something that gets continuously updated. And I think, you know, both for low and middle income countries and for, for countries that are high resources, you know, what is the essential pieces that we need everybody to understand when they walk into an ICU? Yeah. Can we, can we do something to uh, benefit more from the family presence? Uh, I, I often uh, try to convince the family members to stay in the ICU and to hold the patient's hand. And I'm not speaking about COVID, I'm speaking in general. But uh, uh, relatives very often want to leave right away because they don't like the environment very much. And they, they take the excuse that my father or my mother needs to rest. Huh? I say, no, 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 no. They need to rest during the night. No, 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 no. Please tell them stories and... Uh, distract them, uh, but they, it, it's, it's sometimes difficult. Whereas in the past, it was, mm, no family members, please go home. Uh, you have just half an hour to see your lo loved one and then you leave. So things have changed, but uh, um, I think it's so important to get the help of the relatives. Uh, um, Orlando, what they, I, I know you have a special interest in this. Yes, the, the family is very important to the patient. And we, in, in low middle income countries, it's very difficult to implement that the family is with the patient in the same room. But we are in this condition um, about last years, um, only with a simple thing to put a chair for, for the family is, yeah. is enough. Uh, we can um, tell to the, the family that, that have a book to read to the patient or they have a mobile uh, dispositives to, 
watch some movies or watch some stand-ups, something that the patient uh, makes uh, feel better. We must uh, do simple action with great impact in the attention of these patients. The, 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 the relatives may um, be comfortable with the patient too, not only the patient. Uh, yeah, itself. absolutely, yes. Shala, you, you, you wanted to add something. No, I, I agree with that. I, I'm a firm believer in family presence, especially for end of life cases. I think it makes a huge difference. Uh, families may be, they may be having some issues with fear themselves, but I think reassurance and getting palliative care or social work can also help if families are a little hesitant. Yeah. Elizabeth, do we have an uh, open, yes. uh, open uh, visits now? Uh, well, at the moment, uh, it's still, uh, very difficult and last no, 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 I'm speaking about outside the pandemic, of course. Yeah. It, uh, mm -hmm. it was not yet implemented and most of it was because of the resilience by the nurses and the doctors. It's really something that they should go. That's often the issue. Huh? Yeah, the nurses initially don't mm -hmm. like it. Yeah. Uh, I much more cannot. in the others. and 30% of our ICU survivors, oh, they have a post-traumatic stress syndrome, 30%. But one of the environments is when they have a social network. A social network protects you as a patient from a post-traumatic stress syndrome. And we should not forget how traumatic the experience is for the relatives. I sometimes see patients at my outpatient clinic of nutrition, you know, with sh uh, short bowel because of COVID-19 necrosis, the, the patients sometimes look better than the relatives because they have gone through hell. And we should not forget the relatives of the patient in this whole story. Um, so this is really important, but not always easy to implement in your practice. Absolutely, very good point, yeah. We are reaching the, uh, the last comments. Uh, Laura, would you like to make a last comment? Um, I can pick up on the families, if you like. Uh, North America, we have generally quite an open um, uh, visiting uh, policy. And for us, uh, in this time, it's been a really closed uh, period. So what you've seen our teams do um, is, you know, really encourage those video chats. We've had families drop things off at the hospital, like pictures and stuff like this, and we'll still decorate the rooms. Um, you know, we'll talk to them about what their relatives had to convey, provide those messages. Uh, but it's, we do all of that to maintain the humanity in the ICU. And I think a lot of what we've been talking about today um, and a lot of the stressors that we're experiencing goes back to how do we maintain our humanity, um, you know, as, as all the other speakers have pointed out, both as people and as professionals. Um, you know, one of the other things that we find ourselves doing in the pandemic is also understanding that many of the family members also have COVID. Um, and, you know, just touching base with them and making sure that they sound and are still okay and don't need to come to the hospital themselves. And I think, you know, this is an extra strain on us as, as caregivers that, you know, we haven't discussed, but I think it's important to acknowledge because the worry about what happens at home um, is there in a way that it hasn't been before. Very good, excellent. Yeah, I think we had a very good exchange of, uh, of ideas and uh, I think this was very interesting. So our time is up. So I would like to thank you very much uh, for your support and your inputs. And of course the conversation can go on, but uh, we will put this, um, this session to a close and thank you very, very much. It was very nice having you here. Take care. Bye-bye.